Hi everybody, thank you so much for joining us here today and I have with me Heather Darcy who you may very well recognise from her book on Anna of Cleves which is wonderful. I've just been reading it this week and catching up a little bit. So thank you so much for joining us here today because I know people are going to love to hear you talk about Anna and I know you are quite rightly very passionate about her. Well thank you for having me here today. Oh, now there's a little bit. I'm keeping an eye on the internet here. I'm keeping an eye on the internet. So, first of all, can you introduce us and tell us a little bit about yourself outside of your history work? And then we will move on to your history work. Sure. So, I have a Bachelor of Arts in German Languages and Literatures. I start, started studying German when I was about 15, and then I majored in that in college. And then I got a Juris Doctorate in American Jurisprudence, and I I'm a lawyer when I'm not at work. I'm actually a public defender, so I help indigent people with their criminal cases. And I am about two thirds of the way through a master's degree in early modern history of Western Europe. So that's a really quite impressive CV. <laughs> so obviously you have an interest in, in history and politics and government. So is there kind of, were you interested more in this side of history because obviously being in the US, we have so many people who absolutely love British history, but they don't always come into British history. It comes as sort of like a sideline. So yeah. what brought you to studying like English history or the Tudor period specifically? Did you come in? A lot of people say, oh, I read a book about Anne Boleyn and I absolutely loved it. Or I just found Henry really, really fascinating. So did you come into history down that sort of general interest route? Or did yes. You love it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, and I learned about um, bits and snatches of German history, including the Cleves territory when I was in undergrad. Mm. So I already had a slight familiarity with um, where Anna of Cleves was from, because right. when you go forward to the 1600s, in 1609, the Thirty Years' War started, and that was basically trying to determine how to divide up the territories that Anna's family owned because all the male issue had died out. Mm. So I, I mostly knew it from that. And then I had read about Elizabeth I when I was a kid, and I just really, really liked her. And then after law school about 10 years ago, when I had my, when I was allowed to read things for fun again, um, <laughs> I started reading more about the wives and I just got a little bit tired of reading about how Anna was just ugly and then was ditched and trapped in England for the rest of her life. And so like we see with so many different women, I think now there was more to her story and I wanted to figure out what it was. And I figured, well, I can just write a letter to Cleves and see if they have any ideas for me or if they'll even really talk to me. And they did. So. Excellent. Because I would, I always felt like she was a little bit brushed under the carpet. Yeah. Because she was around obviously for like a, a short period, a very short period of time, the shortest. And it was like, Oh, well she came and he didn't really like her. And then they got rid of her and here's the next one. And she seemed really brushed aside, really, yeah. like e even for that sort of very general level of interest, it was almost. Like, and oh, we, we look at the portrait, and I don't feel that she was ugly or anything no. like that. She, you know, she looks beautiful in that lovely portrait. So this is going to bring to us, isn't it? When as we come through, we're going to be talking about all these types of things. Yes. So that's where your love of history came from, and where you're moving forward with that now. So that's lovely, right? Uh, I should also say that my my dad had always grown up reading history. He he did a different time period than I did, but I always had history in my life. I just kind of branched off and started reading about what was interesting to me. So there was definitely that influence too. Uh, yeah, and I think that's that's something that happens quite a lot, isn't it? You hear a lot, and I'm sure you've had conversations with people when they've said, oh, you know, my, my sister or my dad or my mom started reading mm -hmm. something and that sort of sparks that initial interest mm -hmm. which is really wonderful it's definitely something we have to thank our parents for yeah These yeah things that we mm -hmm. might not have done otherwise okay so we've talked a little bit about Anna and why you chose her and at what point mm -hmm. did you think you know I'm going to write a book about this lady I'm exploring her and I really think she's been massively undersold here and now I want to put this out here and tell everybody really what her story genuinely is. I had thought that maybe I could write a book starting in about 2015. And then I think I really became passionate about it in 2017. So 
to me, there's passive and active research, and then there's active writing. So there's three stages when you're working on a book or any research project. The passive part is you're reading a lot about things that are maybe tangentially related to Anna. So for me, that would be reading books that are more about the six wives and not specifically about her. So that was the passive part. And the active part really started in about 2014, 2015, when I was writing to Germany to see, well, hey, can I, can I do something with this? And um, then the really active research started in 2015 to 2016 when I was corresponding quite a bit with the German archives and I sent a lot of scans that really helped me and just general conversations with the, the kind people in Germany and going over there and kind of poking around and seeing what there was to see and what there was to find. I mean, that's how we came across Berg Castle or Schlossburg and Zollingen, which is probably where Anna was raised. Um, we don't really know where she was born. Tradition says she was born in Dusseldorf, but there's a good chance she could have been born at the Cleves Castle or at this Borg Castle as well, because that's where she and her sisters grew up or spent most of their time. With, in terms of your research, you took quite a lot of trips, didn't you? And I really I took feel like lot. those yeah. were like next level you know, a lot of people with it, and they have to research sometimes. I can't remember, I was speaking about this the other week, saying, you know, you're sort of, I think it was Adrienne, you're out wherever you are, and obviously, you know, if we're here in the UK, then we sometimes take that for granted, but when you're overseas, it's, it's like, it's difficult, it can be prohibitive in terms of cost, so yeah. for you to make those trips to get that information is amazing. So yeah, and some of it was pure luck, so I, the the trips that I did were more to make sure that I wasn't wrong in my understanding of German history. So I had already completed most of the research and a lot of the writing before I went to Germany. Right. Um, but strangely enough, I have a pen, pen pal named Tanya Klimek, and she and I became pen pals years before I started writing. And she lives in the same area as the main archives relevant to Anna. So she kindly, she and her family kindly hosted me. And I was able to stay with her and she took some time off work and we just went around and explored things together and went to the museums. And it was, it was really nice. And I, I'm hoping to see her again soon, but uh, things are a little crazy in the world right now. But yeah, so that was part of how I was able to do it was just the kindness of having friends all over the world, really. Yeah. And I think um, I also took some trips to England in 2016, 17, 18, that really helped me too. And just get a feel for, what Anna's life over there was like. I don't write about it quite as much. I mostly focus on on the German aspect because I think we have a good idea of the English aspect. But yeah, and some a lot of that was due to friends just that I've made along the way and staying with them and, and going on adventures with them. So This is a real advantage, I suppose, of, of the world getting smaller, isn't it? Yes, it, yes. It's easy for, like, for us to like, have this conversation for mm -hmm. And then just say, oh, you know, you've met somebody and they're along the way. And it's, it's a really wonderful thing about life now. But as you say, at, at the minute, things are a little bit crazy, really. Yeah. Um, however, hopefully it will get back in time. Something so, will happen. Yeah. Something, <laughs> hopefully, a good thing, hopefully a good thing. Okay. So in terms, obviously, we've spoken about how you have come out and you have made Anna available to everybody a lot more, which is fantastic. Um, so now we're starting to look at her with you very much more as her own person mm -hmm. now. So looking at her like that, how do you think she would have felt as this woman that we're finding more out about so we can perhaps glean more of, of an idea of, of her and how she would have thought about things. This is a bit of a broad question, I guess, but how do you think she felt about the match with Henry? Because I think a lot of people would have gone, oh, no, no, I don't want to go anywhere near that man. That's terrifying. The, the one anecdote I was really able to find is that she lorded it over her brother Wilhelm's head. Oh. Because, of course, because he was just a petty German duke. So she really rubbed it in his face whenever she could. And also, he was her younger brother. So she did do that. Um, one thing that I like to bring up is that her elder sister, Zabilla's husband, Johann Friedrich, was some occasionally off and on regarded as the fattest man in Europe. And oh, so, that's quite an and, and I think it's important to bring that up, though, because, of course, Henry was not small by the time Anna married him. And no. 
I have not found these letters. They may never have existed or they may not exist now, but it wouldn't surprise me if they kind of had some conversations about or some letter writing about, hey, how do I be a good wife? And maybe they didn't, I don't know, but um, she definitely liked being elevated over her older sister and her brother who were just yeah, petty dukes in German. Being the youngest sister and then obviously having a brother normally the brother would sort of take precedence and now she as you say and this is one of the lovely all these little anecdotes like this really show the human side I think of people <laughs> it's easy to sort of miss by reading just yeah, your average texts if you like mm -hmm. um, it, it really shows a lovely side to her because um, I, I, I sometimes feel that she was an amazing woman and she never really got to shine and be herself I think she would have been an amazing queen consort Oh yeah. Really and what I like about Anna too is in my mind, she's kind of the queen of shade as well. I mean, if we look at what she did when she gave back the wedding ring to Henry saying, I need you to break this apart as a thing of no value. That's a serious insult. I mean, you can look at it on its face where she's saying, oh, we should break this up because we're not married anymore. Or it can be, hey, you broke your promise to me. This thing is worth nothing. And so are your promises. Take this back. You know, or how she behaved with Catherine Howard and I go over this in the book, but everyone thinks yeah. that when Anna first sees Catherine and she's prostrating herself before Catherine, it's because Anna has demurely accepted that, <clears throat> that Catherine's the new queen. And I'm sure there is an element of that. But I think the other thing that was going on is you have Anna, who is a grown woman, 25 years old, and she's encountering this teenager and making her horribly uncomfortable. Because Anna and Catherine, of course, knew each other. And so I really just think that Anna had a low-key edge to her, but she was clever enough to kind of hide it. Yeah, so. I, I won't. We want to keep some of the stuff, but there's another thing in this exact same topic. When people read the book, to look out for the part about the gifting of the horses and the trappings. Yes. Yeah, which, mm -hmm. so when you read Heather's book, you'll see how this all ties in together. And I was reading it and I was thinking... Yeah, clever girl. <laughs> Queen of shade. So yeah, I like her. <laughs> love it. I love it. So in terms of like things we think we know about her and things we don't, this is a brilliant one that we talked about. Um, the classic story of Anna waiting to meet Henry. At, well, no, waiting to get to Henry further on. She'd stopped at Rochester Castle, and Henry being like this, this sort of in love with being in love and trying to be very gallant, bursts in on her and expects her to swoon at his feet. And then she goes, oh, no, no thanks. And, um, and then, of course, he's rebuffed and he's crossed and his ego is bruised and, bruised, and that was the start of everything going horribly wrong. But actually, that story about the meeting at Rochester and then him kind of just leaving and that was it, isn't what you found at all, is it? So no, it's not different. Well, we have to keep in mind that that story was made up during or at least was reported during the annulment proceedings. So we're talking six months later, and it was a story that was told, or an anecdote that was told at a time specifically when Henry was trying to show that he and Anna were, never consummated their marriage, that he wasn't attracted to her, that they didn't get along, and that their marriage could be annulled. So that's why we have that story. When I looked at a German source, there's a letter from a few days later that um, I think Oles Lega one of the uh, advisors that went with her originally to, Germ to England sent to Anna's brother Wilhelm and their mother Maria saying that everything went great, that Henry came in and he did, he did come in disguise. Anna didn't know who he was at first, but he presented her with a goblet that was encrusted with rubies and crystals that they dined together that night and had a great time that he got up and he, and or that evening he retired to an area with some of his gentlemen that was still close to the castle, but not so close that it would endanger Anna's honor, came back the next morning, had breakfast with her, and then they carried on to Greenwich later and had their formal official public meeting for the first time later that day. So this is, it's wildly different. And I think another thing that we have to keep in mind is we don't know how much English Anna spoke at that time. There's no record of her having translators all the time, really, unless it was um, during the annulment. And I'm not trying to say that she was fluent in English at this point. I don't think that that's true either. But she might have been able to greet Henry and, and exchange pleasantries with him and with her ladies. That could have been something that she was capable of doing, especially after spending several weeks in Calais. 
Yeah. So when you look at the German sources, that was kind of the first big hint of, oh, geez, there's more happening here than I thought. Yeah, it's, it's, it really is one of those really enduring tales, isn't it? it really, mm. Some stick more than others. And that one really, really seems to have stuck. Um, and that was really, really interesting and useful to me, actually. I actually grew up, you could see um, my, my sister's bedroom. You could see the castle from my sister's bedroom. Oh, okay. So we watched wow. castle and cathedral kind of have a bit of a special place in my heart. So that was sure. always a story like, oh, wow, well, I finally kind of got a really Tudory link to the castle right there. Right. And I, my Tudory link is still there, but it's not quite what I thought it was. <laughs> quite, this is quite a nice special thing for me to read that yeah. in the book and have you relay that story to me so I'm like oh, I'm very excited about that one. um okay so one of the really um the main sort of gist of your book really which is really really important and um I definitely feel is a story that we need to know is going back again to all these commonalities that people discuss is that Henry met Anna he didn't like her he kind of tried to push her away Catherine Howard caught his eye and then he was back to I've seen someone else I like so I want to get rid of the last one what can I do to get rid of, of Anna so I can have Catherine and that's kind of the common sort of theme but actually before this before Rochester we look at the political and diplomatic situations going on in Europe and that's obviously the underlying reason that you have written this whole book was to show that all these things aren't the case there's so much of it and it is obviously I'm trying to get you to sort of take your lovely long book and put it all into a very tight <laughs> space okay. of time and we don't want too many spoilers either do we that's no we don't true. we don't want too many spoilers but can you just give us a kind of a general overview of where we're going with that and then when people read the book they can fill it in and it will really all nicely fall into place Wilhelm and his brother massively went behind Henry's back and that caused a lot of political issues that put England in potentially in the crosshairs of the Holy Roman Empire. Which is and not that was the it. you want to be. Yeah, so. No, no. And I think Henry genu genuinely liked and honored and respected Anna. Mm. And I think that that's why he saw an annulment rather than trying to do anything else and why he took care of her because she was basically trapped in England after the annulment. She couldn't go home because it would have been too dangerous for her. And that's actually remarked on um, by some of her, the people that came over with her in January of 1540 as they wanted to go home sooner rather than later because of the issues that Wilhelm was creating on the continent. They were afraid of getting caught up in it. Because that's an, another thing actually you hear is that, um, or I have heard, is that she didn't go home because it would have been too humiliating what had happened to her. No. But I think as well, when you're a woman in her situation, you don't always get a choice anyway, do you? No, and I don't think that, I think her brother would have been happy to have her home, and there was a time where he was demanding that she come home, but I don't think he would have had the resources to bring her home because of the other things that he was doing, but also there's that very real danger to her person of mm -hmm. crossing through French and imperial territory to get home. There's any number of things that could have happened, and I don't think either Henry or Wilhelm wanted to be responsible for something bad happening to her. Yeah. I wonder if whether or not she had been able to go back, if she'd have found they'd oh, well, they would have found her another match, she would have undertaken another marriage. Because one of the things I always think of was, was she did she ever feel alone? You know, and it's impossible to say I know, but obviously she never married again. She had lots of people around her, and she had ladies who I would have thought some of whom she trusted and took into her confidence and enjoyed their company, and she could go to court and all of these things. But it's not necessarily quite the same as being, even in a royal marriage or any sort of marriage of that isn't necessarily a marriage for love, but you know, did she ever feel sort of a bit isolated or a bit alone? Would she have liked? To have had a husband and the chance to have children and so on and so forth i think she would have of course there's no smoking gun that says that but there are letters from the early 1550s where she's writing to wilhelm saying england is england and we're strangers here and this is the early 1550s so she's been there for over 10 years so she still feels like a foreigner and is perhaps in some ways still treated like a foreigner 
And when she wrote this letter, I can't remember if it was 1552 or 1554 off the top of my head, but it's the reign of either Edward VI, where he really didn't give a wit about her, or early on in the reign of Mary I. I, I don't know that Anna could have married when she went back to Cleves. Um, they had, there were four siblings all together. There was Zabilla, the older sister and the oldest of the children. Then there was Anna, then there was Wilhelm, and then there was little Amalia. And Amalia never married. So Wilhelm did attempt to find matches for her and that was never successful. So I don't know that Anna would have been able to. And part of that was because of the political situation of not just Wilhelm, but also their brother-in-law, Johann Friedrich, the elector of Saxony, and uh, their nephews coming from Zabilla and Johann Friedrich. And also, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Let me back up. What normally would have happened to someone like Amalia, the youngest sister, or what was very common was that they would have been sent to an abbey or a convent or something like that, or been, become a religious person. But by this point in the Reformation, the 1540s to 1550s, that just wasn't an option anymore. And all those religious houses had been shut down, torn down in a lot of areas in Germany. And there was actually this movement, this is a bit of a digression, but a movement in the 15. 70s, I believe, called Hausvater literature, which was, which were like manuals or guides written for former clergy members who became husbands because they had no idea how to be husbands. So, but so that's a bit of a digression. So I don't know that she would have been able to find a husband just because if we look at what was going on with Amalia, the younger sister, she couldn't. Um, and then as far as Anna's life in England, I don't know that there was anyone appropriately of her status yeah. in England. Yeah. She was elevated to being one of Henry's sisters. And we all remember what happened the last time someone married Henry's sister, Charles Brandon. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and who could have, and who was supposed to pay Anna's dowry at that point? I mean, I'm guessing Henry would have helped her, but there just wasn't really anyone available. And I know briefly during the reign of Edward VI that Anna was contemplated as a bride for I believe Thomas Seymour but nothing ever really came of it That's it. No and I mean very briefly like there was not a lot of conversation about it very briefly but yeah I, I don't know what she'd have made of that actually so no <laughs> but um but she was quite well liked wasn't she although she had been sort of in the position of queen well she was queen wasn't she but let's just say in the position of queen yes, for a okay. comparatively short space of time and she was elevated greatly but you know as you know as you sort of came away from london and the surrounding counties for the people sort of in the midlands and the north anything could have been happening in london and in court but i get the impression that she was actually quite popular even though she, you know, hadn't been queen, and, and which is, is a really nice thing to think of, that this, this lady, this wonderful lady, who had been sort of really put aside and treated quite unfairly, um, was still beloved and still sort of cherished, and people knew who she was and where she came from, and I, I hope that she knew that. And, but she did quite, you know, from what you've said, and she did actually quite enjoy a lot of aspects of living in England. I think so. She was, she was better off financially in a lot of ways. Well, not even in a lot of ways. She just was better off. In German culture, it was kind of similar to French culture where German women could not inherit. So the idea of her living alone as an unmarried woman in Germany was just, that just would not have happened. She, maybe if she were a widow, but not with her status, she would have had to go back and live with her brother until her death. And that, again, we see that reflected with the youngest sibling, Amalia. She lived with Wilhelm until her death in 1586. That doesn't really, when, when she's, okay, so the marriage didn't work out, one of a better expression, but actually she had so much more freedom, didn't she? Yes. That it might have been a little bit miserable to go back to being restricted like that when she'd had that wealth and that status. Probably it would have been that the, the happier option to be able to stay in England where she was. Yeah, I think so in some ways. And also when we look at the education of young German noble women, they weren't taught things like playing instruments and singing and dancing. They were taught this is how you cook. This is how you get food for your household. This is how you run your household. This is how you make clothes. This is how, and they learned embroidery and they did learn some other things, but it was a very, very practical education. Um, and so she was perfectly suited for running her own household by herself too. Yeah, yeah. 
So yeah, she didn't need a man. No, she didn't. I think she did get lonely. And and again, in the fifteen yeah. fifties, we have that letter of her um, complaining about being treated like a stranger, like a foreigner, or an outsider. And so we do know that sometimes she still struggled with it. But I think overall, she got the better end of the deal. And she wasn't. She didn't have to worry about her home being threatened by war. I mean, obviously she was very upset when there were different battles and wars going on with her brother Wilhelm and her sister Zabilla. And so in that way, that must have been heartbreaking, mm-hmm. which I go over in the book, but she herself was physically safe. Yes, absolutely. In England. Um, I think it's easy to sort of lose sight of that, isn't it? Because this is one of the ways where she kind of disappears again. You know, she got her her annulment settlement or whatever you want to call it. And then, and she's talked about, you know, she was actually the last of Henry's wives to pass away. But again, she's just kind of, she disappears, doesn't she? She gets her yeah. settlement. She, there's that, that, that new year at court. And then she just kind of blends away and, and vanishes out of, of, almost out of existence. But mm-hmm. did she spend much time at court afterwards? Oh. I'm not sure. I think that she was allowed to come to court, but I have not found a lot that says, yeah, Anna was here thus and such day. That being said, if she was such a normal fixture and there was nothing exciting going on involving her, I don't know how much that would have been recorded. She did come back uh, quite a bit after, or she, she was at least spoken about quite a bit after Catherine Howard was taken into custody and later beheaded because there was some hope that she and Henry would remarry. So there was definitely a lot more information, excuse me, contemporary information taken down about her at that point. But other than that, things are kind of quiet towards the end of Henry's reign. I think she was just living her life. She occasionally would tour her properties is my understanding, or at least would go to some of them and just hanging out. And it wasn't, it's not really until Edward's reign that we see her come back, but it's more so because Edward was trying to pull away a lot of her properties and just kind of figure out what to do with her. Cause he didn't really care about her from what I can tell her, at least his regents um, couldn't, didn't really care about her. She wasn't useful to them. Yeah. And then she, unfortunately she got on the wrong side of Mary, who was only a few months younger than Anna. They were the same age. Mm-hmm. And so she kind of re- withdrew from court at that point in about 1554 until her death in 1557. It's, it's strange to think of all the people that had been and gone in that time and Anna was still there. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah. It really is. In terms of people thinking, including herself, perhaps that there may be a renewal of the marriage between herself and Henry, especially obviously once poor Catherine um, lost her life. There has also been various tales um, about her having a secret child with Henry, uh, which is always one of my, I, I've seen one, um, one story where someone says that she had twin girls and, and they're descended from the, one of these twin daughters. And I, I know you, you do sort of mention this, but I, I find this one really difficult because obviously the, this whole part of this annulment was based on long consummation of the marriage. And, um, but just like, where has that even come from? It's so well, strange. There's one, there is one tale. There was a rumor in her lifetime and I'm trying to remember the exact dates and I have it in my book. So you have, when Catherine of, of Catherine Howard was taken into custody, I think that was in November of 1541. Mm-hmm. Um, back in August of 1541, Henry had visited Anna and that was really the only time that he had visited her probably over that summer because I think they had the summer progress and so on and so forth. So that was really the only time he had visited her and then he didn't visit her between August and Catherine Howard's fall. But in early 1542, Anna had taken ill to her bed and she had suffered some sort of illness off and on and she eventually died probably of some sort of stomach cancer. We don't actually know, but she had abdominal issues a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, But so she had taken to her bed because she was ill and someone reported to Henry that she was holding a baby one day. And so Henry went to investigate it to see where the baby came from. Wow. What it was, was her, one of her ladies had given birth to a baby boy and brought the baby boy to meet Anna to help Anna because Anna was recovering to make her feel better. 
that's that's so, an amazing leap isn't it <laughs> yeah that's and we have to keep in mind too wild. that when the only opportunity that they would have had you know that august 1541 which i mentioned henry was still very much happy with Catherine howard mm -hmm. so there wouldn't have been a reason for him to do that and also anna when we look at her as a person what would she gain from having a royal bastard absolutely what would that do for her i mean if she ever because in 1541 she's 26 years old still of marriageable age probably still hoping to get married if not to henry to someone else yeah but if she went and has an affair and has an illegitimate child with someone how does that help her in either germany or england it doesn't make any sense no it doesn't it, it's just that is a real these things spring from all sorts of places but that is a real high-end big leap <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah. So what actually is the reality of the situation there's really really sort of diametrically opposed things she yeah. sounds like such a sweet woman and i'm sad for her in a lot of ways because i feel that she was very discarded and at, yeah. obviously when they were convocation and everything like that there was very much she wasn't allowed to speak for herself no one was allowed to speak for her like you know as such people brought all this information in and there was absolutely no right of reply in any capacity whatsoever. It, it was all, it was one of Henry's foregone conclusions or for, for his advisors to create a foregone conclusion, which was quite right. a commonality. And, you know, at least some in the past, you know, if you look at Anne Boleyn and you look at Catherine of Aragon, they were at least pretending to give them a chance to stand up and say I this. I think Henry learned his lessons, so. <laughs> yes, women are actually more intelligent than you think, Henry. And if you let them hand stand up and have a say, then they will. And they will mm -hmm. shame you. King or not, they will shame you. But mm -hmm. it, just, it just feels, and, and I suppose, again, we put how we feel about things now onto then, and we shouldn't, whereas now we would look at much more equal rights, we would say somebody has to be able to stand up and represent themselves or be represented. But she really was just sort of almost shunted. Well, in not entirely. So her advisors, they knew that there was this convocation and her advisors asked her, hey, do you want us to try and intercede for you or, or something along those lines? And she said no, because she knew that their marriage was valid. So the, the bases for the annulment, there, there are three things. Basically that Anna was already someone else's wife, the Duke of Lorraine. But we know that that contract was ended in 1535. And I, I'm working on a second book right now. And so I go a little bit more into what was surrounding that, that negotiation and things along those lines. I don't fully explore it in this first, in Anna, Duchess of Cleves. But so she wasn't pre-contracted to anyone. And the other grounds for annulment were non-consummation. So that's why Henry had to make up reasons and everyone else had to make up reasons for why he wasn't attracted to her. The only one who actually called her ugly, I think, was Sir Anthony Brown, who was worried for him and his half-brother about what Henry would do if he was mad at them. Because also at this time, Cromwell was thrown in the tower. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, and then the third reason was that Henry did not inwardly consent to the marriage because his princely heart had severe issues with her possibly being someone else's husband. Yeah, exactly. But so Anna didn't ask to have her counselors go. And who knows if they would have been able to represent her at I, this time. I don't you know? think it would have made a difference personally. No, but she didn't believe that she needed to because she knew in her heart that everything was, was fine and was valid. And she was absolutely devastated when she found out that she wasn't the queen anymore and they kind of brush it off for henry and said oh well we don't think the translator translated what we were saying correctly so we're going to have him write it down in german but i think that was probably more an opportunity for anna to compose herself and for henry to maybe marginally save face if they could blame it on her lack of the the translator rather than anna's lack of understanding or actually being devastated but yeah she had no reason to think that this would actually go through oh wow so it's, yeah and, and that makes perfect sense as well I, you know if she's got a clever mind and, and a, you know a, a good conscience in her heart she would say well this is the truth i know the truth so they can mm -hmm. go and discuss this as much as they like but that's not going to change the truth exactly you no know, it did didn't stop it being true but it was good enough for what henry required at the time which is well and then keep in mind he turned around and married Catherine howard as fast as he could and then that way by the time the news got to wilhelm 
there wasn't a darn thing he could do about it yeah that's one advantage of messages moving a lot more slowly you wouldn't get away with that these days so um i have one more sort of cheeky question for you um what do you think about Anne of Cleves in Six the Musical? I love it. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> I got to go see the musical in Chicago last year. I don't live too far from Chicago. And oh my gosh, it is fabulous. I, I maybe sing it and blast it sometimes. And I really like the House of Holbein song too. Yeah. It's very cute. Um, no, I love it. I think it's great. And overall, it's a really good production. And if you ever get a chance to see it, definitely go see it it's it's worth it it's kind of like a pop concert yeah but it's a lot of fun. it is a I, lot of fun I was supposed to go in March but once again yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. for October but I don't know I you know it's really yeah. stuff to wait and see but I love Anna in that I just yeah. think that you know because because we know much less about her even in in terms of mythology and you know all the things that you sort of looked at and gone actually no that's not right and it's just she's just this woman and she just goes in and says i've got all this you said this about me you are wrong and i don't care yep. and she's just this really really sort of strong independent woman who just doesn't give two hoots about what Henry or anybody else thinks and she's just doing her thing and I, I absolutely love it she's got some of the, her her song has some of the best lines in it oh absolutely it's just a fun song so yeah. hats off for the, for the no, writers tells me I need a rich man doing my thing in my palace at Richmond right <laughs> Well, and I think I touched on this in the book, but I think that Anna also served as a really good role model for Elizabeth, because I think we frequently look at how, oh, Elizabeth was probably horrendously traumatized because her mother and her cousin and, or excuse me, yeah, cousin Catherine Howard and her stepmom Catherine Farrell died from childbirth or being married. But we got to remember that Anna was around until only a year and a half before Elizabeth became queen. She could have served as a pretty good role model. Yeah. Just saying, hey, this is how you can live in England and you can be an unmarried woman because technically Anna was never married as a result yeah. of that annulment. Never married, never had kids. She did fine. Yeah. So do you think that she did the best out of the six wives in the end? I don't like to think that way. I don't have that sort of a mind, but I think that she made the best of her situation and I think that she had the most control of her situation in the way that women as wives did not have much control. She was able to run her own household. And of course there were the issues under Edward VI, but I think that she was allowed to be herself perhaps more than the other women were. And I think that's valuable. And she managed to keep her head attached to the rest of her, which is always a bonus. Yes. (laughs) Yes, yes, very much so. Oh, you have your book there. Can we show the show everybody the cover? Because it's a beautiful cover. It's gorgeous. And just quickly as well, you can tell us about the portrait on the front yes. of the book. So I'm going to try and zoom in here with my iPhone so you guys can get a good look at it. So this portrait was probably completed in late 1538. It's I found some new evidence in the second book that I'm researching. It's called The Children of the House of Cleves. And it looks more at Anna's family in Germany and why they were important. Because I think we, most of the things I've read until I really started researching her made Cleves kind of seem like this random backwater, tiny little dinky country that didn't mean anything. So it really kind of digs into that. So it's possible that portrait was also done in 1535 when, um, anyway. And the last time it was really seen in England from some of the papers I'd been reading was in 15, or excuse me, 1939 ish 1939 or so when it was auctioned off at christie's and it turns out that some american art collectors and art dealers bought it brought it back to the u.s they never sold it and these two brothers had the last name rosenbach they were born in pennsylvania and that's where they lived and after they passed away they donated excuse me everything that they had remaining in their collection and the rosenbach museum was created and the brother who purchased that painting liked it so much he never sold it. And it's just been in a back hallway in that museum. A shame. Yeah. And one thing that I really like about that portrait too is she's wearing this hat embroidered with these beautiful pearls. And during her formal meeting with Henry at Greenwich, she's described as wearing a hat embroidered with pearls. And so I think maybe it was the same hat. Yeah. And it, there is some mention of portraits of both Anna and Amalia being sent to Henry before Henry goes to send Holbein to yeah. paint Anna. 
And so it wouldn't surprise me if that was the portrait that Henry saw. And if part of the reason why she wore the hat on the day of the official meeting was so that everyone in Henry's court knew who she was because they'd already seen that portrait. And I don't, I don't know this. There's no way to prove it, but it makes a lot of sense. It does. Yeah, it absolutely makes sense as well. Oh, I mean, I mean, also we all know that the classic portrait of Anna that we always see the most, but you can see so, yeah. in the one on the book, you can clearly see it's the mm -hmm. same person. You know, oh, absolutely. And there's a later portrait. I'm just going to flip to a page in my book, but it's at um, St. John's College in Oxford, and they were kind enough to let me look at the portrait and the literature they had on it. But here we go, guys. Okay. So there's the 1535 or 1539 portrait, and then there's this one down here. So these came from the same, that one there that I think is also quite popular. Oh, Those came from the same workshop, but the, um, research on this painting i'm going to close the book now the research on the other painting shows that it was actually painted in the 1570s after anna's death so there were some portraits of her being turned out after her death but the uh the one on the cover was taken from life as far as i can tell wow so many little gems and we rely on yeah. people like yourself to find them so i'm really glad you have um thank you so much for today it's been yeah. i've really enjoyed reading your book i'm finding out more because there's a lot that I, I didn't know it was a little bit sketchy, but the whole people need to read it. You need to read it. You need to, you need to <laughs> thank you. Well, it's available <laughs> on I know Waterstones has sells it as well. If you want a signed copy, the Canterbury location of Waterstones does have some signed copies because I go, I'm not coming back to the UK, I don't think, until next fall, unfortunately. No, it's um, wrong, hasn't <laughs> it? Everyone's trips and plans have all been cancelled. Yeah. Well, hopefully book two will be out by then. So, and hopefully I can come and, and meet people and talk to you guys about, about that in person. Um, and then Barnes and Noble, if you're in the US, they have it, like I said, Amazon does. Right now, there are very few hard copies of the book left. Yeah. yeah. So you can pre-order the paperback. I It was originally supposed to be released in July, but I think it might've been pushed back to November because of the pandemic. And I don't I don't think it'll be pushed back any any farther than that. I'm hoping, fingers crossed, we can get it before. Yeah, it but, very much but yeah, at the minute. So, so definitely yeah, and and if people can't wait that long, it is on Kindle as well, isn't it? So it is on Kindle, yes. If and you if really you can't want... wait for a physical copy. Oh, and yeah. to get a physical copy, that is also an option as yeah. well. Yeah. So okay, well, thank you so 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 much for coming along today and talking to us about Anna because I love her. I think she's wonderful, and I think it's a shame we didn't see more of her in you know because I think she'd have been an amazing queen consort. But you have done her a great service. So get along and buy Heather's book because you will really enjoy it, and it's just got so much information in it. It's fantastic, and we will look forward to the next one as well. So let us know you. when you know what's definitely happening. Okay. I will. Okay. Thanks so much. Take care. Yep. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.